uh, I'd like us to think about the reconstruction book, his reconstruction in philosophy. I hope you have it with you. And uh, next week, we'll um, be getting into phenomenology and existentialism. Uh, two weeks of that uh, before we have another examination. Ouch. No, I'm not saying that for you. I'm saying that for me. Uh, ouch. <laughs> no, they don't. They just take an awful lot for me to write down uh, on your exams, yeah. And uh, then we'll have the remaining four weeks, I think it is, on um, 19th and 20th century empirical and analytic philosophy. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess uh, that's it. All right. Um, do is reconstruction. The title is the giveaway, isn't it? And uh, consequently, in the light of that title, I've um, subtitled all the chapters, Two Views Of, this, that, and the other. Because I, I think he is consistent in carrying through the theme of the overall title all the way through the book. He's talking about what philosophy classically has been and uh, what he thinks it ought to be. And the same with regards to each area of philosophical inquiry. And so you get these two views. But I, I think it's important to recognize that underlying his disagreements with what philosophy has been is a very different view of human nature than um, in the classical tradition. Uh, after all, um, classical philosophy was substance rather than process in its metaphysics. That is to say, an unchanging, qualitatively unchanging entity is basic to everything. And so in talking about human nature, the underlying substance, of course, is uh, that substance or those substances which make up a human being. Uh, with emphasis on a soul substance or the body substance matter and um, qualities, functions thereof. Now, um, when you change from that uh, substance view, uh, the process view, um, it may be difficult to say it in the English that has been shaped as a language by substance thought, but the fact is that a human is a process, not a substance, ultimately. Uh, that uh, if we're going to uh, therefore understand human nature and implement a view of human nature into uh, philosophy, we, we have first of all to think of um, uh, the human as a process of experience. And if you say, why experience? Um, the answer, I think, is twofold. One, um, from an empirical standpoint, how do we talk about personal identity? If it is not, as in the empiricist tradition back to John Locke, in terms of the way in which um, memory of the past and anticipation of the future are um, identified within present experience. Uh, so it is the um, matter of experience by virtue of which we have any identity of which we're conscious. Um, that, if you like, is the epistemological reason. But, of course, the, uh, the other reason is that in this Hegelian tradition, in which, following Kant, uh, human consciousness is the lens through which everything is understood, and the Hegelian tradition, the Hegelian tradition uh, with its um, unfolding of consciousness in the process of history, you see, how are you going to describe uh, any evolutionary process? And in as much as Dewey is, as we noted last time, evolutionary naturalist, um, the, the, the process of evolutionary development is really uh, an extensive process of experience. Um, and certainly for a human being, life is experience. In fact, it's interesting that um, in our day, there's a popular use of the term reality, which makes it difficult for beginning students, I'm finding, to get a handle on what is metaphysics. Because the popular use of the term reality is what's real in my experience, rather than what is real in itself. You get the difference? Metaphysics is concerned with the thing in itself, reality. But reality has come to mean the reality of my experience. Yes, sir. Well, that's uh, part of this whole movement of thought uh, out of the 19th century German tradition into, yeah, we'll see it into existentialism and so forth, but certainly into Whitehead and Dewey. So um, the, the human has to be understood then in terms of this, uh, this concept of experience, a very rich concept of experience, much richer than that thin sort of one-dimensional concept which John Locke has, simply made up of simple ideas, much richer than that. But when you start approaching um, what is human nature in terms of experience, then it's, uh, it's understandable that he's going to be uh, saying that um, human beings are first and foremost creatures of desire rather than intellect. Because concrete experience comes loaded with um, emotional orientation, with affective attitudes towards past, present, future, the whole thing. Um, now add that to his um, functionalist psychology that we were talking about, and you can see that in any case, thought is going to be simply a function of a biological organism um, in response to experience, which initially is being physiologically based, is affective initially. So um, a very different conception of man than that of the rational soul inhabiting a body with some fixed essence to human nature, and so forth. Very, very different. So then, in the, uh, the first chapter, he, uh, he stakes that out in the first half dozen pages, uh, if you like, as premises of the entire book, um, and then goes on to um, point out that the old philosophy is one uh, consolidated as uh, theoretical doctrines, uh, because um, it arose from the desire, desire is the key word, you see, philosophies, doctrines, moral beliefs, arise out of the desire to, uh, to consolidate, to retain the past so that the ideals that um, were successful in the past should be perpetuated. And so it's as if we want a, um, a quick freeze-dried past and accordingly um, a philosophy of static positions, unchanging. Whereas um, what we, we need to do is to recognize that experience is an ongoing thing, life is an ongoing thing, and um, uh, philosophy is not to be a set of doctrines, uh, but rather a reflective attitude about experience and 
desires and conflicts of desire and threats to what we desire. Uh, so philosophy for Dewey is more attitude, a philosophical attitude, if you like, uh, than it is any set of doctrines. Uh, which is why when I uh, talk of Dewey as an evolutionary naturalist and ascribe to him a metaphysical naturalism as well as a methodological naturalism, I do it with sort of a hesitance in my philosophical conscience. Because uh, he doesn't want to be thought of as having a set of fixed doctrines. Because he does. One of them is evolutionary naturalism, and another is functionalist psychology, and so forth. So um, uh, that's the, uh, the first um, note to, to strike there. Uh, feel free to um, feedback, uh, react, question, coming on this as I talk. Um, six. Um, upon the page five, he says, we need to recognize that the ordinary consciousness of the ordinary man, that's what he's after, the ordinary consciousness of the ordinary person, experience, you see, uh, left to himself, is a creature of desires. The consciousness is a creature of desires, rather than of intellectual study, inquiry, or speculation ceases to be primarily activated by hopes, fears, and so forth, only when he's subjected to a discipline that's foreign to human nature, which from the standpoint of the natural is artificial. And so the artificiality then of um, classic philosophy. Um, all right, the historical factors in chapter two, his review of some historical factors in reconstructing philosophy, um, really uh, two views of knowledge, where the old, which he traces back to people like Aristotle, is the attempt to find unchanging truth about unchanging essences. And you do that, of course, by abstracting from experience rather than working with experience. You abstract from it the essence of a species and do uh, deductive reasoning from your knowledge of those first principles abstracted. Um, so that's the form that knowledge takes. Uh, but the other kind of knowledge is what was uh, introduced by Francis Bacon uh, with his classic dictum that knowledge is power, not contemplation of essences, but power. Not knowledge of the unchanging, but knowing how to affect change, knowing how to exercise the power to change. And um, that is the, uh, the big watershed, that distinction. The, um, the old wanted demonstration, proof. The new is after a discovery. And so what uh, Dewey envisions is the extension of the Baconian vision of the utility of knowledge in giving us the power to change things. The extension of that to the natural sciences, which was Bacon's vision. Uh, you may recall he wrote a work called The New Atlantis, uh, which was his vision of a scientific utopia that um, he thought his queen Elizabeth I should be mighty excited about. Um, but uh, he, he wrote that scientific utopia thing. Well, what Dewey wants, you see, is the same sort of um, power released in changing human experience. Now to the social sciences, to the human sciences. And um, consequently, um, his thought is that the problem-solving techniques, which his new logic develops, remember we were commenting briefly on that last time, that the problem-solving capacity of knowledge can be applied to the human condition, to social problems, political issues, international problems. Now, he's uh, writing this primarily between the two world wars, between 1918 and 1940. Uh, so he's uh, thinking in terms of the economic depression. He's thinking in terms of the, um, uh, the uh, development of uh, socialism throughout the Western world and uh, the appearance of communist um, uh, dictatorship in the Soviet Union. In other words, the immense upheavals in the old system, uh, politically, economically, changing the face of um, uh, at least Europe. Um, he's uh, recognizing political tensions and uh, the old um, dream that World War I was a war to end all wars. You know, from this vantage point at the end of the 20th century, we sort of smile. I notice smiles on your faces as I said that. A war to end all wars. Look at the way it's um, yeah, but he's concerned, you see, with problem solving, conflict resolution. Ah, now you, you see, the notion of conflict resolution is one of the paramount things in um, certain aspects of uh, political science. There are some people who define political science as the science of resolving conflicts. This is a John Dewey definition of politics. You see. Politics used to be applied ethics, uh, but thanks to its becoming a social science, and the social sciences having been taken over by instrumentalist views of knowledge, uh, such as Dewey's, uh, you, you see, it becomes not a branch of applied ethics, except in the sense of Dewey's instrumentalist ethic, a way of resolving problems. Um, so um, the historical factors then come in at that point. And if you look on page 43, you can see how he articulates it. Um, top of 43 in the language of Bacon. While we've been reasonably successful in obtaining command of nature by means of science, look at the technological revolution, uh, our science is not yet such that this command is systematically preeminently applied to the relief of the human estate. Such applications occur, but are incidental. This limitation defines the special problem of philosophical reconstruction at the present time. So he's um, pretty explicit. Uh, about that sort of thing. And uh, what he wants, of course, is that the uh, changes in society should be from some investment in eternal and universal and unchanging principles uh, to um, um, the development of specific means for resolving problem situations as they arise. An ad hoc sort of thing, rather than anything else. Situation ethics applied to public policy. Yes. Um, the scientific factor underlying this reconstruction, chapter three, really two views of the natural world. The two views of nature, what's been going on in the history of natural science that makes the difference. And it's here that he makes plain his repudiation of the um, theory of fixed forms that came to us from Plato and Aristotle. Um, the uh, theory of forms which translated into the fixity of species, fixed ends, 
what he calls a closed world, and let us say a universe with already defined potential, a defined potential, closed, rather than open-ended, anything's possible. Incidentally, an interesting parallel in Dewey there to what you'll find in Sartre, if God is dead, anything's possible. You say, if there are no fixed ends, anything is possible. If there are no fixed forms, anything is possible. And um, in that sense, there are some similarities between uh, the sort of thing that Jean-Paul Sartre was doing in France, and um, uh, a little bit before it, in a more benign fashion, um, Dewey was doing in America. Um, Dewey is sort of the um, American counterpart of what was developing in the other continent in existentialism. You see. If you have a value-free universe, then we have to um, create the values. And there's a sense in which Dewey is saying that same thing in his particular instrumentalist work. So then, the, um, the modern version in the light of Darwinian theory of natural selection is that there are no fixed species, there are no fixed forms. This is an open-ended evolutionary process, an open world rather than a closed one. And that means, of course, that there is no feudal hierarchy. There is no natural law as a basis for jurisprudence. There's no natural law. The ends are always situational ends emerging in the problem situation, with room then for a constant evolutionary change. Um, on page uh, 70, um, he says in the middle of the page that fixed forms and ends mark fixed limits to change. They make futile all human attempts to produce and regulate change except within narrow limits. They paralyze constructive human inventions, uh, their theory which condemns them in advance to failure. It wasn't until fixed ends were banished from nature that purposes became important as factors in human minds capable of reshaping existence. I'm not sure that's historically correct, because it seems to me there's a lot of reshaping that goes on in the uh, Thomistic tradition of the final causes they have. Uh, the whole business of nature and grace reshaping to appropriate ends. But um, Dewey's reading of the situation is pretty quick. Well, um, there you get the historical factors, really, in those first three uh, chapters. And um, that much, I think, um, comes through without any problem. Okay? Uh, chapter four, um, entitled Changed Conceptions of Experience and Reason. Um, yeah, he's talking, basically, of changes in the understanding of experience. And on page 83, um, 82 and 83 and 84, uh, this uh, comes most into focus. He points out on 82, at the beginning of the new paragraph, that the empiricism of Locke was disintegrative in intent. Now, um, this time last week, we were reading a passage from Whitehead which said the same thing. You remember that Whitehead said that um, experience, um, ideas, experience for Locke was separative as well as prehensive. It was separative, and he wants it to be prehensive as well as separative. That's to say, Locke's ideas are atomistic, isolated, each an island under itself, no in internal interrelationships. Relationships are all external, separative. And Whitehead's arguing for prehensive relationships whereby one naturally leads to another. There's internal relationships. Well, Dewey is making essentially the same point. That in concrete experience, there are no isolated atoms of experience. There's a continuum. Uh, there are internal rela relatednesses. So in Locke, it is disintegrative. Uh, Hume raises questions about the artificiality of that. And at the bottom of 83, he introduces two things that have made possible a new conception of experience. One, the primary factor, is um, change in the actual nature of experience as it's actually lived. He comes back to that on 86. But he goes on, the other is the development of a psychology based on biology. This is his functionalist psychology. He picks up on that first of all in the immediate paragraphs that follow, um, where he says that um, the effect of the development of biology is that where there is life, there is activity, activity which is continuous, adapted to environment, not passive. And so there is very much of the causal continuum reflected in experience. Experience at the top of 86 becomes primarily an affair of doing, the organism does not stand about, Macawber-like, waiting for something to turn up. Is that literary allusion lost on you, Mr. Macawber? Always waiting for something to turn up? Um, that's Dickens. Um, and for the life of me, I forget, is it Oliver Twist or David Copperfield? David Copperfield. Yeah, All, uh, Mr. Macawber, always waiting for something to turn up, uh, Macawber-like. Okay. Uh, the organism doesn't stand around Macawber-like. 